It's a great day to dive into God's Word. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and I'm so glad that you've joined us here on Through the Bible for our study in the Old Testament book of Amos. Our teacher, of course, is Dr. J. Vernon McGee, and he's got a lot of great things to share with us. But first, let's hear a couple of letters from our listeners. The first one's from Cindy in Madras, Oregon. She writes, In 2005, I was widowed and moved to Wisconsin. I got a job driving a truck delivering bakery goods for two counties. I was grieving my husband's death. So numb and full of pain after a long marriage, I felt lost without him and wondered, how would I survive financially and emotionally? I needed help and God's guidance. Through WRVM, I heard Dr. McGee along with many other valuable programs. Sometimes I stopped the truck just to cry in grief. But the Word of God has brought me through, and your program made a huge difference in my life. You were a special friend when I was all alone. In the years that have passed, I married again and have found a new life. I am writing a book and going forward with God in many ways. Much happened, and God has always been faithful. I was so thankful for your teachings at a time when I most needed the Word of God and His encouragement. And then here's a letter. This is from Nicholas in Mountain Home, Idaho. I'm a single father raising three beautiful boys, and I have been on the Bible bus for two years. Thank you so much for your program. It really helps me understand God's Word and also helps me live out His Word in my life and to help me guide my boys in the way they should go. Please pray for us. Thank you, and God bless you. So as he comes to mind, why don't you lift up Nicholas and his boys today up in Idaho. May God be real as they live and love him together each day. Our last letter comes from Gloria in Rescue, California. You asked us to write and let us know what this Bible teaching means. Well, it means everything. You are the only opportunity I have for Bible teaching. There isn't anything anywhere near this in this area. I was saved back in 1951. Phew. What a long time ago. But God's grace and mercy is still new and exciting. How precious is His Word. I pray for you every day and for new doors to open up for the Word of God to go out. You're doing a splendid job. God bless your ministry. You indeed are a blessing for this 86-year-old. Well, thanks so much, Cindy and Nicholas and Gloria, for taking the time to write to us. And we'd love to hear your story, too. Maybe we'll even share it in one of the upcoming studies that we've got. You can email us at biblebus at ttb.org or send your note to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Let's pray for God's wisdom as we gather around His Word now. Our loving Heavenly Father, may Your Word do marvelous things in our hearts as we listen today. Revive and refine us as we submit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Our friends, as we come back here to the 8th chapter of the book of Amos, to the 7th verse here, you will find that we are in the chapter that we have labeled a vision of a basket of summer fruit. And we saw that that is highly suggestive And it does speak of judgment, the judgment of God upon the nation. Harvest time is that. You remember that the Lord gave a parable that at the end of the age, he'd send forth into the field those to do the harvesting. And he also said for us not to pull up tares, that he let them both go together at the end of the age, the harvest time, he would be the one to make the distinction. And after all, he is the only one who can make that kind of a division, and it will be up to him at that time. So that we have seen that that is a picture there. But summer fruit is so delicate that it doesn't take it long to spoil, and therefore it must be consumed immediately. And man's goodness, he says, to Israel in that day, And to us today, that our goodness is just like a basket of summer fruit. It looks very nice now, but it won't take it long to spoil. That's man's goodness, by the way. You know, some days I find out that I'm a very sweet little Sunday school boy. My wife commends me for being so nice and sweet. And then there are other days that the summer fruit spoils. And she tells me, she says, you're not really the 
sweet boy that you were yesterday or last week. So that that is human goodness today. What a picture this is. This man, Amos, was a preacher with a tremendous imagination and a tremendous message. I more or less fallen in love with him, as you can see. Now I'm reading verse 7. The Lord hath sworn by the excellency of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their works. Two things that are here. The excellency of Jacob is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's sworn by the excellency of Jacob. What is that excellency? It's the Messiah that is coming. You could take no oath higher than that. And he says, surely I'll never forget any of their works. Well, we saw last time that he doesn't forget works at all. Even of the believer, we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And we are to be judged by the things that have been done in the body, whether they be good or whether they be bad. What a picture that is given to us here in that connection. Now, will you note, as we move on down, verse 8, shall not the land tremble for this, and every one mourn that dwelleth in it. Now, many commentators think this is an earthquake, and it could possibly be. I wouldn't want to rule that out. But I think it's the fact that God is coming down hard upon them in judgment that makes the land tremble. Even today, you can't go through that land. And this is especially true of the northern kingdom. That is, it's all one today, but in that day, it was the kingdom of Israel. You can't go around places like Samaria. It's rugged hill country around Gilgal, around Bethel. All of these places are in a frightful state. It looks as if at one time it was a very fruitful area and that there was a great deal of vegetation there, including a great many trees. But the land has been pretty much denuded today. And it shows the evidence of judgment upon it. God came down heavy on that land. And we're going to see at the end of the next chapter that the promise for the future includes the land with the people. That people and that land go together. You can't separate them at all. And that's a very important thing to always note in prophecy. Now, we're going to see that. Whether it be judgment or whether it be blessing, the blessing will come to the land as well as the people. And today, again, I would say that's another reason that I cannot accept that the prophecies of the Scripture being fulfilled in their present return. To begin with, they have returned physically to the land, but they have not returned spiritually to the Lord. And there's not the blessing upon that land. It hasn't changed. Now, it is true that they have worked, and they have worked hard. They have recovered a great deal of it from swamps, and they have gotten irrigation into the desert in many places. And when they do, it does blossom as the rose. But those places are few and far between, even in that small land today. So that you could not say that these great prophecies are being fulfilled today. The last return to the land has not taken place yet. To begin with, there are more today in New York City of Israel than there is in the entire land of Israel, the nation of Israel. And that ought to tell you something. When most of this country moves to London or to Paris or to Rome or to North Africa, then I will come to the conclusion that America is pretty much divided when we lose the population like that. Now, let me read on. Verse 8, shall not the land tremble for this and everyone mourn that dwelleth in it? And it shall rise up holy like the river, and it shall be cast out and drown as by the river of Egypt. And as you know that down there during the season of the flooding, the whole land there is flooded. And it not only brings water to the land, but it also brings a great deal of fertilizer as it comes down 
from the very heart of Africa itself. Now, he goes on here in verse 9, and it shall come to pass in that day. Now, here is Amos speaking of that day. And we have already come to the conclusion, at least I hope we have, having looked at so many of the prophets, that that day is a technical expression that refers to the specific day of the Lord. And generally, it refers to the great tribulation because it comes first, because the day begins at night as far as Israel was concerned and as the Bible is concerned. It's the evening and morning of the first day. And I don't know whether you'd say it that way or not. I never would have. I would have said the morning and the evening of the first day. But the day of the Lord begins in darkness, and Amos has made that clear. And I think that here he moves on to speak of a judgment that is coming in the future. Now, if you'll notice what he says here, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. Now, that will be the future judgment, you see. Now, he says here, and I think he's returning back to what he's going to do at that particular time, which he did, by the way. He did not do the other, that is for sure. Now, verse 10, and I will turn your feasts into mourning. Now, God gave to Israel the nation, seven feast days. And they were to come before him, the males, at three of those great feasts. And they were to always come rejoicing. It was a time of praise, thanksgiving, and glorifying God. Well, God says they've been celebrating the feast, but they haven't been praising him. Now he's turning their feasts into mourning, the very opposite of what he intended them to be and all your songs into lamentation. Now, isn't it interesting today, and I'm no music critic, and I don't want to get into that field, but what is popular music today? Now, when I came along as a young fella, in my day it was the blues, and then it was jazz, and then it was the rock and roll, and today it's the hard rock. Now, I ask you something as you listen to the music. Do you hear anything joyful about it? Oh, it has a beat to it, and you can hop up and down like a yo-yo, and I have a notion that that type of joy is about the type of joy that a kid would get playing with a yo-yo. It doesn't require very much thinking, and it is something that is just worked up of the flesh, and it's that type of music that the world has always produced. It's mourning. It's tragic. I had the privilege of being in Vienna and going to the opera there. I really was coming up in the world. I'd never done that before. If you want to know the truth, it's the first opera I'd ever heard. And I hate to confess it, I enjoyed it. But you know what it was? It was a tragic thing. The boy didn't get the girl. My, that was tragic, you see. And the songs were lamentations and wailings. Now, that is what the world produces today. That is the music. And here, God says, I'll turn all your songs into lamentation, and I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins and baldness upon every head, and I will make it like the morning for an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. Now, that is the judgment that was coming upon them presently, and it did in that day, and this was literally fulfilled. Now he says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Now, here is a most unusual famine. God had given them his word, and they had rejected it. They had despised it. They had turned aside. Now, he says, the day is coming when you're not going to hear it. In other words, the day is coming when no longer will they hear the word of God. Now, I hear a great many people today mourn and bemoan the fact that so many of the great churches of this country, great downtown churches, 
have turned from the Word of God. Most of them have had to close shop. They're just barely operating, many of them operating in the red. No longer is that Word of God being given out in real Bible teaching. Now, there's a lot of things called Bible teaching that actually is not that at all. At least, in my judgment, it's not that. So, those churches, many of them have closed and they've lost their influence. Those that have even stayed open, they've lost their influence, lost their drawing power. Now, what is happening is this. God says to any church or any nation, if I've given you the Word of God and you don't hear it, then I'll withdraw it. And that's what he's done. And you can deplore the fact all you want to about some of these churches today that have gone modern. They no longer hear the Word of God. Well, what did they do with it when they heard it? Many of them rejected it and turned their back upon it. And there came a famine of the Word of God. As a result, very little of the Word of God actually is getting out in this land today where there is a Gideon Bible in every room in every hotel and motel of the country. Nearly everyone has a Bible, but who's studying it? Who's believing it? Who's reading it today? That's the important thing. And I think that we're beginning to see the famine of the Word of God in this land. Now, will you notice, they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the Word of the Lord, and they shall not find it. And today, we get any number of letters here from different areas of this country. They say, we've had no Bible teaching in our town or our community for years. Bible teaching is something brand new to a great many people. Why? The famine's already set in, friends, in this land of ours. And we believe that although we appeal to a minority of a minority, that is, we have to appeal to Christians, but how many Christians today really want to study the Word of God? So we appeal to a minority of a minority. But today, we feel like the most important thing we can do, in fact, it's the only thing that we can do, is to give out the Word. Now, will you listen? Verse 13, in that day, now here we are back at that day, shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst. Now, Joel has already spoken of that, that there would be a day coming when it would be like that. Isaiah spoke of it, that even the young man would faint. And Amos makes it clear that it's for the Word of God. Verse 14, They that swear by the sin of Samaria and say, Thy God, O Dan, live it. Now, many took an oath by Samaria. And that was a common oriental practice. I understand today that in that land that a man takes an oath by even a trip to Mecca or takes an oath by one of these mosques. It's a custom in that day. Then he says, The manner of Beersheba liveth, even they shall fall and never rise up again. These were great centers of idolatry at this particular time. Now we come to the last chapter, and it's evident now that we'll not be able to finish the last chapter today. He says here, verse 1 of chapter 9, I saw the Lord standing upon the altar, and he said, Smite the capitals of the door, that the posts may shake, and cut them in the head, all of them, and I will slay the last of them with the sword, he that fleeth of them shall not flee away, and he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. Now, this is the coming of the Assyrian to destroy the northern kingdom and to take what was left in the captivity. Now, the altar that he's talking about here and the temple is not the one in Jerusalem. It was the one that was in Bethel, and the one that was in Samaria, where the golden calf was. I've seen the ruins of the temple in Samaria that was there. And the temple would be brought down so suddenly that many of the people who went in there to seek refuge would be caught, and they would be trapped in there and be killed in the temple 
because of the fact that they sought refuge there. Now, this is the judgment that was coming upon them. Now, up to this point, Amos has dealt with nothing in the world but judgment. Judgment that was coming soon upon them. Judgment that's out yonder in the future that he identifies as the day of the Lord. And we believe that that's what the Lord Jesus meant and spoke of the same thing, and he called it the great tribulation period that was coming upon this earth. Now, in this last chapter, we'll see that next time, and we're going to see that for the first time, he looks into the future and gives the glorious prospect of the future. So in that very dark day, Amos is no pessimist. He looks way down into the future, and he sees coming a glorious day for this earth. I think that any child of God today ought to be an optimist. None of us ought to be a pessimist. No reason for it. Well, we won't know when he's coming, but let's continue to wait patiently and watch for his return. Day by day, it's getting closer, and he could return at any time. You know, there are some, however, who take that optimism a little too far by making predictions and setting dates. So at a later date, Dr. McGee added a few words of caution. Stay with us, and we'll hear those in just a moment. But first, I hope that you'll partner with us in getting the word out while there still is time for people to hear and respond in faith. God has given us an open door to share his word in more than 120 languages and dialects worldwide. So join us in praying for God's word to be received by everyone who hears and that the gospel would be preached to every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. To sign up for our team of committed prayer warriors called the World Prayer Team, visit ttb.org forward slash pray. And to learn more about supporting the mission of Through the Bible financially, you can call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Now, as you reach out with God's Word, we want to help you too. So visit ttbinmylanguage.com. It's there that we offer Dr. McGee's studies in more than 100 languages. Again, that's ttbinmylanguage.com. There you'll find links to these studies in English, French, Arabic, Spanish, Zulu, Lingala. The list just goes on and on. And of course, to study God's Word, you need access to God's Word. And thanks to a partnership with a ministry called Faith Comes by Hearing, you can also share the audio text of God's Word in more than 1,300 languages by visiting the resources section of ttb.org and clicking on Bible in My Language. Now here's Dr. McGee to close our study. But in our optimism relative to the future, friends, we need to be very careful because we're living in a day when there is all this interest in prophecy and it has now led some to get into the area of setting dates. And may I say very candidly that date setting is absolutely unscriptural It leads to fanaticism and sensationalism and to nothing else. And finally, of course, to disappointment. Did you know even to say Jesus will come before 2000 A.D., which many folk right now are saying in many good men, you have no right to say that. That's setting dates, by the way. We don't know that he's coming before 2000 to take his church out of the world. Did you know that the statement we make, and I've made it, Jesus is coming soon, that's not in the Bible. We were never told he was coming soon. We were told he's coming imminently. He could come any time. And that is the thing that the church is told. We're told that we are looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. Nothing in the world about signs, just looking for that. Not only looking, but We are told that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Now, we're listening for the shout. That's the important thing for the church. We're not looking for signs. We're looking for the blessed hope. We're listening for that shout. And that'll be the first time that the church will know anything about his coming. Now, date setting is out and should be. Somebody says in the book of Revelation, he says, Behold, I come quickly. Well, that doesn't mean soon. What he's saying is those great world-shaking events that are mentioned in the book of Revelation, absolutely catastrophic events that are global in their extent and actually reach out to the heavens around us, that they take place in a brief 
period of time. We believe, many of us, that it's confined in a period of seven years and that it's confined in actually the last three and a half years of that seven years. That is the belief of many. And that's what the Lord Jesus meant when he said, behold, I come quickly. That was for the benefit of those that get into that time. And if they happen to be God's people, I tell you, it'll be nice to know it won't last very long. And that is the thing that he's saying. Now, today we're waiting for his coming. And that is something that requires, I think, just a little patience on our part. Until next time, may the Lord bless you, my beloved. Jesus came home, all to be my own. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners, whom God uses to take the whole word to the whole world.